Welcome to Hope Church. We are so glad that you are joining with us today. If you are new here or would like to find out more about our church, visit us at hopekansas.church. We believe God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. Now, get ready for some heartfelt worship and a great message. Our salvation is in His blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, His kingdom come. Jesus, Jesus, our redemption. Is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. So we will sing, we will dance, till the earth echoes the heavens. Sing his praise, till we see the other side. We belong to the light when the night is at its darkest. Just hold on, for the dawn will soon arrive. Can you feel the winds are changing? There's a new day on the rise, and the atmosphere is breaking as the new world comes to life. So we will sing, and we will. Until the earth that goes to heaven Sing His praise Till we see the other side Whoa, whoa, whoa Whoa, 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 whoa. Praise you, Jesus. Can you feel the winds are changing? There's a new day on the rise. And the atmosphere is breaking as the new world comes to life. So we will sing and we will dance until the earth that goes to heaven. Sing his praise till we see the other side. Whoa, 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 whoa. Got a feeling the darkness won't last very long. I've got a feeling the darkness won't last very long. No, and I've got a feeling the darkness won't last very long. Oh, I've got a feeling the darkness won't last very long. I've got a feeling the darkness won't last very long. Let us sleep in 
So we will sing, we will dance Till the earth that goes to heaven Sing His praise Till we see the other side Let us sleep in a world awakened There's a new day on the rise And the enemy is shaking As the graveyard spring to life So let us sleep in a world awakened There's a new day on the rise And the enemy is shaking As the graveyard spring to life So we will say and we will dance Till the earth that goes to heaven Sing His praise Till we see the other side Whoa, 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 whoa. is in his blood jesus light of heaven spread forever his kingdom And the empty grave, and now we're free. 
working Even when I don't feel that you're working You never stop, you never stop working you never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see that you're working Even when I don't feel that you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working
Good morning. Today we are embarking on our 21-day focus as we begin this new year. So last week we talked about vision and what God had for us as a vision, using those four words that we will be using frequently this year as we look at how we are to love God, how are we to find family, and how are we to share hope. And we want to do that by saturation in the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. We want to do that in participation of the vision that God has given to us. We want to also do that by connecting and connection with one another. And then lastly, we want to do that through reach, getting out past ourselves and bringing others to the gospel. And as we begin this 21-day focus, one of our areas of saturation will be fasting and praying. So I encourage you. Uh, here in Wichita, at all of our campuses, consider fasting a, a day uh, during the week or maybe a, a, a meal a day or some way fasting. Now, remember, fasting is not just giving something up, which is good. I mean, we can give things up, and it, it's important for a focused time. But fasting is literally dealing with what brings us sustenance, and we cannot live without food. In the same way, the reason fasting is important is God wanted us to understand we cannot live without Him. So we're replacing when we would normally eat a meal with a time of focused attention to the Word of God and prayer. So let me encourage you to consider doing that. Again, if you have any dietary concerns, check with your doctor and find out what you can and cannot do. Also, in all of our campuses, we are going to do praying on the sixes. And what that simply means is over the next 21 days, beginning tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. at all of our campuses from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., we will have prayer Monday through Friday. Here at Wichita campus, we'll be actually on the grounds in some of the other campuses. You might be doing it at home or wherever, whatever your campus pastor instructs you, but we want everyone to consider from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. at least once a week, try to find one of those slots and and pray. Also from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday. We'll have our normal Wednesday night services, but Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday evenings, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Again, if it's at the building at your campus, go if you can, or if you need to, just pray at home. But take the time to focus on on prayer and seeking after the Lord. The 21 days of focus, we want to get saturated with what God has for us. And as we embark on that, we're going to be exhorted from the Scriptures over the next 21 days as well, and we're going to remain focused as we look how God wants to reveal His character to us through a story that we look at in the Scriptures. We're going to place ourselves before the Lord. We're going to fast and we're going to pray. We want wisdom. We want discernment. And we want clear Holy Spirit leadership as to how he wants to direct our lives in every aspect. And as we do that, the overview that we're going to look at is a model in Scripture that kind of mirrors, if you will, the day in which we live. And it mirrors for us what are to be our time, our actions and our our look and our focus during this time. We want to align ourselves with God's will and with God's ways. We want to we want to follow the pattern that we see numerous times in Scripture where God brought His people to a point of focus so that the kingdom of God could be advanced. Now, specifically during our time, we are actually going to look at a story from the Word of God and look at a person that's very familiar with all of us and probably most of us have either read this story or heard it read and and listened to it numerous times. It's the story of Noah. Now, every one of us, when we think of Noah, we immediately think of the ark. We think of the flood, the, the gathering of the animals, the time of the great flood, All those things, we think of the destruction that came on earth. Those are all things that begin to fill our mind when we think of Noah. And to this day, there are still search parties looking for Noah's ark. In fact, over the Christmas break time, I saw a documentary, another documentary of uh, of a group that that had scaled the mountain to try to find Noah's ark and all the details, and that was very recent. So there's still these desires to find Noah's Ark. And so as we look at it and the details around the story, I want us to start this journey by actually looking at the words of Jesus concerning 
the days of Noah. So take your Bibles, go to Matthew, the 24th chapter, Matthew, the 24th chapter, and let's read the scriptures. Verse 37, when the son of man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming... He would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that your word is inspired and errant and infallible. And as we, Lord, journey into the life of Noah and the whole situation around what was going on at that time, we ask that you would awaken our hearts to the revelation of your word. So, Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts to apply what we're going to hear today. Make us good soil that the seed of your word would go deep into our hearts and bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. We understand today that as we begin this focused time, these 21 days, that it's very important for us to have the understanding of your scriptures before us. Help us, God, as we walk down this road. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Jesus uses the parallel of the days of Noah as he addresses his return to this earth. He talks about the need for focus. He talks about the need to be ready at all times. In fact, Jesus will use a phrase at the end of of this that, that really grabs our hearts. He will say, be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. That's a pretty strong phrase, when least expected. So the question that we need to ask is, how do we live in the light of this truth, in the light of the truth of the days of Noah? And according to Jesus' words, that's what it's going to be like when he prepares to return. And we see all around us what we saw and what we witness as we read the days of Noah. And so God wants to reveal his character to us, and he wants to show us how to live in the midst of of that as we prepare, because the end of time is closing in on us, and we realize that. We look around us, and we see what's going on in our culture. We see what's going on with all the things we read in Scripture, and we see the end coming and closing in, and so we have to live in light of that powerful biblical truth. So we have to ask ourselves, what is God revealing to us? What is he saying to his church in this hour? How are we to live and impact others in the hour and the moment in which we live? So the first thing we want to look at in this series is actually, I believe, the most overlooked aspect of the story of the days of Noah. It's the most overlooked area because it is the area that people rarely discuss when they talk about the story of Noah. I want to awaken you to what I believe is one of the most important, powerful aspects of how we are to live in the midst of the day we live. Yet, it is probably what I'm going to share with you today. To me, behind the scenes, it's a powerful revelation of God that's going on in the days of Noah. It reveals the character of God. It allows us to focus in the midst of our day, in a way that God desires for us to do that. So what is this powerful principle that is at the scene of Noah but is overlooked? Write it down. God's all-encompassing mercy is revealed. God's all-encompassing mercy is revealed. Let's read the story of Noah, and I want you to see how his mercy is revealed. Let's go to Genesis, the sixth chapter. Genesis, the sixth chapter, we're starting in verse five. The Lord observed the extent of the human wickedness on the earth. And he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race 
I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. Now stop there for just a moment. Because you read that and you say, Pastor, I don't see any mercy there at all. Oh, there is that phrase that it broke God's heart. It broke his heart. I see that phrase, but I see judgment there. I don't see any mercy at all. Well, let's go ahead and continue to read verse 9. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, God saw that the earth was, had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world for everyone, so the earth was corrupt. Everyone on the earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them out, all out along with the earth. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar outside, inside and out. They construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. Look, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood, and I will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die, but I will confirm my covenant with you. And so enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring a pair of every kind of animal, a male and a female, into the boat with you to keep them alive during a flood. Pairs of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. And be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Now pick it up in chapter 7. When everything was ready, the Lord said to Noah, go into the boat with all your family, for among all, for among all the people of the earth, I can see that you alone are righteous. Take with you seven pairs, male and female, of each animal I have approved for eating and for sacrifice, and take one pair of each of the others. Also take seven pairs of every kind of bird. There must be a male and a female in each pair to ensure that all life will survive on the earth after the flood. Seven days from now, I will make the rains pour down on the earth. And it will rain for 40 days and 40 nights until I have wiped from the earth all the living things I've created. So Noah did everything as God commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood covered the earth. He went on board the boat to escape the flood. He and his wife and his sons and their wives... With them were all the various kinds of animals, those approved for eating and for sacrifice, and those who were not, along with all the birds and the small animals that scurry along the ground. They entered the boat in pairs, male and female, just as God had commanded Noah. After seven days, the, water, the waters of the flood came and covered the earth. When Noah was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, all of the underground waters erupted from the earth, and the rain fell in mighty torrents from the sky. The rain continued to fall for 40 days and 40 nights. Again, you say, Pastor, I don't see much mercy here. How do you see mercy? How do you see the all-encompassing mercy of God in the midst of that great story? Well, the mercy of God is revealed in the fact that God had Noah prepare an ark of safety with the announcement of judgment and the announcement of the wrath to come. So God had him prepare an ark of safety and write this down because here is the mercy. It took Noah 100 years to build the ark. 100 years to build the ark. So God makes an announcement of judgment, and 100 years later, the floods come. Now, that's powerful. That's amazing mercy. See, chapter 5 of Genesis ends with telling us that Noah is 500 years old, and then proceeds to tell us of the wickedness of man in Noah's day. 
followed by the words of Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. Then comes Noah's call to build this great structure of rescue. And then we're told in chapter 7, verse 6, these words, Noah was 600 years old when the flood covered the earth. Verse 11, when Noah was 600 years old on the 17th day. So we're told twice by God that Noah is 600 years old when he enters the boat. What's he told? Enter the boat and seven days later it's going to start pouring rain. From that announcement to the day of the flood, to the day of the beginning of the flood, we have one hundred years. And to me, that is some kind of show of mercy. That is God making a pronouncement. We just entered the year 2022. Imagine in your mind that in 1922, God makes an announcement that I'm going to destroy the earth by a flood. 100 years passes. That's a lot of time for people to come to repentance. That's a lot of time for people to experience the mercy of God. Think about that. Judgment's pronounced. Build an ark. Build a place of safety. Build a place of mercy. And show the people that they can repent and they can turn from the wicked ways. Now, how do we know that that's what is occurring during those 100 years? Because, guess what? The Scriptures tell us that is what is happening during those 100 years. How do we know that? Go to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. See, we fail to see this side of it so many times. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the 7th verse. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. So for 100 years, he's preaching the fact that you cannot continue to live like this. That's what he does. By faith, he's building this ark. You don't think people came by and said, what are you doing with this crazy, huge structure? I mean, think about it, 450 feet long. In case you're wondering, in our common thinking, that's a football field and a half long. That is not something that just shows up in a little, a little boat on the side of the, of the, of the river here. This is, this is huge. So he's talking to people as he builds. How do we know that? Again, go a little bit further in your Bible to 2 Peter 3. Now look at this. Because this is an amazing context. We have read this scripture numerous times. You've heard it quoted numerous times. But look at the context. Second Peter chapter 3. Going back to verse 3. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. That's exactly what's happening today. Scoffers, are you you kidding? Look what happens. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. And he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. There's the context. He says, creation and the fact that there was a flood. But look at this. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are, going, they are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord. And a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. See, that ninth verse we've quoted numerous times. God is not willing that any should perish, but he wants all to repent and all come to saving knowledge. We've used that, but the context is God saying, look, in the days of Noah, it took a long time before the flood came. And all these other times, and he says, you're thinking, man, what's going on? Is Jesus going to return? Scoffers have risen. God is saying the reason that it's being waited on is because God is patient. He's so patient with the ungodly. He's patient with them. He loves them. He does not want anyone to die without a relationship with him. He wants people to repent. He wants them to to avoid the destruction of sin. So his all-encompassing mercy is pouring out, and that is what is seen in the days of Noah. 
So he says, when Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, yes, destruction, yes, judgment is coming. But God is saying, listen, right here, I'm telling you, it's being held back because of his patience. So yes, we live in a time of chaos all around us. And yes, we see all that. But the first thing we want to see is we're reminded of God's mercy toward those who are outside of the covenant. Those who are outside of God's plan. Those who are walking totally contrary to God. And God is willing in the days of Noah to wait 100 years of loving people and bringing them mercy. So in light of that overriding truth, I want us today to gain a couple powerful insights into who we are and what we can do as we live out this life and character of God. How does it parallel in our life? How can our focus change a little bit? Maybe God wants to get our focus a little different and so that we can understand what we are to do in the midst of the day in which we live. How do we embrace God's character? Let me give you a couple principles today. First, let's understand this. The flesh loves judgment. God loves redemption. Our flesh loves judgment, but God loves redemption. See, when we look at that all-encompassing mercy of God, we've got to deal with this. It does not line up with our flesh. See, we hear it all the time. We get so tired of the evil around us that we scream out for judgment. We would rather see the evil heathens just get theirs and die than for them to receive mercy and be redeemed. See, it's amazing. It really is. It's amazing how quickly we can become people of judgment. Now, think about this with me. Think about this. We receive mercy and forgiveness ourselves. But how quickly we go from that person who's in need and receives that mercy and receives that grace and receives that patience of God. And now we find ourselves easy, easily flowing into judgment for others. It happens so quickly. See, if you haven't noticed, the church of Jesus Christ is a very angry place right now. In fact, it is so angry. We cannot look into the eyes of compassion like we need to because when we look at the lost and hurting and we look at those that are evil and heathen and doing things contrary to the will of God, we find ourselves filled with so much rage and righteous indignation that we're blind to compassion. We're blind to mercy because we are so filled with this anger about how difficult they're making our life. And then... Are you ready? This is hard for us to hear. Then we add to it the political rhetoric of the day. And we add to it that political rhetoric of the day. And it, that begins to justify how we feel. Because some angry politician will rise up. And he will spew out words or she will spew out words of hate and judgment. And our flesh comes alive. Because we can identify with that person. They're standing for what we believe. And we see them as a fighter for what is right. When actually, they're just an angry person. And they're filled with rage and judgment. And guess what? We end up missing the point of 100 years of mercy. And we are consumed with an attitude saying, God, destroy the wicked. Get rid of them. Destroy them. And we know that that's going to happen. We read the story of Noah. God is personally going to deal with mankind. He is going to deal with mankind. We see it in the days of of Noah. But it's not my job. My job is to build the ark of safety. My job is to bring forth the mercy of God. See, but this attitude is nothing new. This fleshly attitude of desiring judgment versus redemption, it's nothing new. It's explained in the prophet Isaiah when he shared about God's character. And what I want to share with you this morning is one of the most misquoted scriptures that you will ever hear in, in the church, it's misquoted. We hear it all the time, and we hear it based on the fact that maybe somebody's in confusion, or a lot of times you hear it around death when people don't know how to respond to someone passing away. They, they will use this scripture, but that's not the context of it at all. See, it's in the context of the fact that our flesh loves judgment, but God loves redemption. Isaiah 55, 6 through 9. You'll see it. It's a very familiar scripture. Seek the Lord while 
you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. Stop there for just a second. Now look at that. If the wicked will just turn, God will have mercy. If they will turn, he will forgive them generously. Ah, verse 8. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. What is God saying in Isaiah? The prophet Isaiah is saying the way of man is judgment. The way of man is let the wicked get theirs. But God's way is mercy, redemption, and forgiveness. And he said it's far beyond anything we can imagine. He says, my thoughts are so much higher than yours. That's why Peter says, as you look at, at the coming of Christ, don't think he's delayed his judgment or forgotten it. Or don't think he's forgotten about you. He's just offering you a door of mercy. And to those outside of his will and his way, he is offering this great desire for them to come to repentance. Why? Because, we've said it here before, redemption is a reward for the sufferings of Christ. It's a reward for the sufferings of Christ, for Christ's sufferings. When people give their life to Jesus Christ, that's a reward for all that Jesus Christ did for them. God did not want to send his son to this earth to die just so he could judge people for their sin. He wants them to come to Christ because why? Christ already took the judgment of their sin. God said, I prayed, I paid top price for you. I paid for the souls of man. And he's not willing to just throw mankind away as we are so many times. He's patient. He's willing to give them the opportunity for salvation and redemption. So listen again. Listen again to some words from Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3. Now again, context is so important. And we, we quote this scripture. 2 Peter chapter, or 1 Peter, excuse me. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. 1 Peter 3, 18. Christ suffered for our sins, once for all time, he never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring them you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited, how? Patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. Now, isn't, again, amazing, amazing. We read this scripture about redemption. Now, there's a lot here. We could spend a, a lot of time, but note this one phrase. God waited patiently while Noah was building the boat. How long? 100 years worth of patience and mercy. Why? Because God loves mankind. Because Christ suffered for sinners to what? Bring them safely home to God. So our flesh likes judgment, wants judgment. God wants redemption. He loves redemption. He wants people to come. Why? Because his all-encompassing mercy says, I long for people to come. We live in the days of Noah. We see a world of chaos, and God is breathing mercy to them through you and I. Second thing we have to learn today is this. The flesh wants revenge and retribution. God wants repentance and restoration. Again, the flesh wants revenge and retribution. God wants repentance and restoration. Now, see, the reason for God's patience and the reason for his mercy is for mankind to repent and be restored. Repentance is not a result of God's anger. It's not. It's a result of God's kindness and patience toward the sinner. We so many times think that, you know, the, the man who holds the sign out, repent for the end is near, or, you know, God hates you, repent. No, it's not God's anger that brings people to repentance. It's not the vision of hell that will bring people to repentance. It's the vision of God's love and mercy. How do I know that? Because that's exactly what the scripture teaches, Romans 2, 4. 
Paul says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? His kindness is given so that it might bring us to repentance, turn us from our sin and turn us to him. That's what that patience and kindness is for. Do people take advantage of it? Sure they do. People take advantage of kindness and gentleness and, and, to, and, and, and loving tolerance all the time and long-suffering. They do. But God says, I'm still going to extend it. But oh, man, our flesh wants revenge and retribution. We want them to get theirs, God. Get theirs. Get what's coming to them. And see, that's fine looking at those in sin now. But looking back at our own lives, aren't you grateful for mercy? Aren't you grateful for the fact that God didn't give you and I what we deserved? Aren't you grateful that we didn't get ours? That God didn't say, okay, I'm going to give you what's coming to you? Aren't you grateful that Psalm 103 says he has not responded to us according to our iniquities? Our sin was forgiven. But they need to pay. Well, no, our sin was forgiven and they could experience that same forgiveness, those outside. See, remember what Paul said in light of relationships. Paul said in light of relationships that we have to those who offend God. Because we all have those relationships. We have relationships with people that are offending God with their lifestyle. We do. We all have relationships with people that are outside of the will of God. We might have family members that are living that way. They're offending God's holiness by how they're living. Some of them are so rebellious that they are shaking their fist in the, in, in the face of God. They're living totally contrary. Yet the mercy of God is flowing out to them. This, God is giving them this wonderful window to repent and give their lives to him. So how are we to respond to them? Romans, the 12th chapter, the 17th verse. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable. Do all that you can just to live in peace with everyone. You know that neighbor that's totally contrary to the will of God? Do everything you can to live at peace. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Wow. God says, let me deal with the judgment aspect. Let me handle the final outcome. You don't need to worry about it. Let me handle the final outcome. I'll take care of what's going on. God says to Noah, your job, build an ark. My job, I'll take care of the flood. You build an ark. You take a hundred years. You do that. And during that time, you plead with those who are lost and outside of the covenant of God. Why? Because they can get on that ark with you. I'll handle the final outcome. I'll take care of the retribution. The vengeance isn't yours. The revenge isn't yours. We are in the days of Noah. We see everything happening around us. And just as Jesus said, it would be that way in the last days. Truly, that's upon us. The confusion, the anxiety, it's something we all feel. As people around us talk about the issues of the day, we all experience that confusion. We all experience that anxiety. We hear it all around us. But into that mix, amazingly, God has placed us. Here we are. Now, we'll look at that more next week. What does that mean for us? But today, what it means for us is God's character and life has to flow out through us. And amazingly, the first aspect of that in Noah's life is actually the one that we fail to see so often in this story. And that is God's all-encompassing mercy. That's Why do we fail to see it? Because our flesh likes judgment. Our flesh likes people getting theirs. But God loves mankind. And he gave his life for their redemption. And God wants repentance 
and restoration in the hearts of people. He wants them to enter the ark of safety. The days of Noah is not so we can scream judgment. The days of Noah is so that Jesus could say to us, yes, I'm coming again. And until I get back, show mercy, love people. Can I just encourage you for these 21 days as you are praying, lay down our anger. Lay down our judgmental heart. Ask God to give us a compassionate heart to those who are lost and those who are hurting. Ask God to give us a desire to reach those. Instead of a vengeance and a retribution, ask God to give us a desire to bring them to repentance. That those that are offending the holiness of God would experience his life. Yes, there is judgment coming, and God will bring it. You and I won't have to worry about how, when, or who's going to bring it. He will bring it. And when the time has come, it will come. But this window of mercy is open right now. So let's be faithful. Let's be focused. We are on that same moment that Noah was. He's building an ark. It took 100 years. I don't know how long we have. God is not slack, though, concerning his promises. Peter told us that. He is coming, and he will bring his judgment. That we'll look at in another message. But today, we want to work while it's still day. We want to bring hope while it's still light out. And remember, remember, as we bring this to a close today, remember these wonderful words of Jesus, spoken to a religious leader. Spoken to a religious leader. Wonderful words of Jesus. You could quote them with me this morning. John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Now, we stop there so quickly. We stop there so quickly. But here's where we're going to read on. It's going to be on the screen in front of you if you're watching this at one of the campuses. If you're here in Wichita, you're hearing this. Listen to these words. Read them out loud with me. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Get that. Get that deep within our heart and spirit. God says the reason that Jesus Christ came was to bring redemption, not judgment. He came to redeem mankind and judge that sin and get rid of it. He is changing the lives of of people. That, verse 17, is the all-encompassing mercy of God. Let me, encourage, let me encourage you. Let me exhort you. We want to gain the character of God through this whole series. It starts with the days of Noah. It starts with this all-encompassing mercy that allowed 100 years for people to repent and give their lives back to God and leave behind their wickedness. God put in us that heart that has compassion and, and, and a desire to see people repent and be restored. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to share your word. We ask that God today you would take this message and challenge us, change us, so that Lord, people around us can experience your wonderful, wonderful mercy. God, allow us to have a soft heart that desires to show compassion toward those in need. Lord, grant to us the ability, Lord, to build that ark of safety, to be a vessel for others to experience your loving kindness. We thank you for it. We praise you for this great opportunity to look into your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you would like to respond to today's service or would like prayer, email us at office at hopekansas.church. If you would like more information about our church or want to catch up on past messages, visit our website at hopekansas.church. Have a great week.